Russia has launched DPRK-supplied ballistic missiles against Ukraine on at least nine occasions. The Ukrainian armed forces undoubtedly have a sense of impunity and all permissiveness. What's more, they're aware of the unconditional support from Washington, London, and Brussels, who do not care about the killing of civilians, the destruction of families and people's lives and futures. Russia and the DPRK must be held accountable for their actions, which undermine long-standing obligations under UN Security Council resolution. In its blind hatred for our country and its desire to somehow weaken Russia, the West is prepared to pay with other people's lives and to renounce universal norms of morality. While Russia feigns concern for Ukrainian civilians in Russia-occupied territories, Russian forces continue to inflict immense suffering on Ukrainian civilians. One hopes that the ordinary citizens of the United States and the European Union who live under brutal censorship and propaganda will hear the whole truth about Kiev's atrocities and the complicity of their own governments in them. They should know that the lethal weapons regularly being sent to Ukraine are used to commit terrorist acts. It is President Putin's single-minded pursuit of the obliteration of the sovereign state of Ukraine and subjugation of its people that is prolonging this war. Among such recent heinous crimes of the Banderite junta is the January 24th premeditated attack on the Russian military transport aircraft Il-76 of the Russian Armed Forces. Russia is the only aggressor in this war and the only one that could end this war today. We have seen the news reports of a strike hitting a bakery in Russia-occupied eastern Ukraine with at least 28 killed on February 3. While we are unable to independently verify that information, the United States laments all civilian casualties and expresses its sincerest condolences to the families of any civilians killed. The unfortunate reality is Russia does not allow media freedom or independent reporting, so such claims are difficult to confirm. Though there is much we don't know, we do know this. The Kremlin bears full responsibility for the unconscionable death and destruction brought about as a consequence of Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine in violation of the UN Charter. Russian forces invaded a peaceful neighbor and continue their relentless attacks against Ukraine. We also know that attacks targeting civilians and civilian objects are violations of international humanitarian law. We again call for the protection of all civilians on all sides of every conflict. All parties to a conflict must take feasible precautions to minimize civilian harm. In contrast to Russia's lack of transparency and contempt for international law, the government of Ukraine has demonstrated a commitment to respect its obligations under international humanitarian law and to fully investigate any allegations of violations or abuses committed by its forces. Though Russia continues to deny investigators access to the parts of Ukraine it occupies, brave investigators associated with the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine and the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine continue their heroic efforts to document and investigate all alleged violations and abuses of human rights, violations of international humanitarian law, and related crimes by conducting fact-finding missions near the front lines and in formerly occupied areas. This reporting has painted a brutal, blood-soaked image of civilian suffering and unspeakable atrocities committed by Russian forces in Bucha and many other places. While Russia feigns concern for Ukrainian civilians in Russia-occupied territories, Russian forces continue to inflict immense suffering on Ukrainian civilians. As we approach two years of Putin's senseless and brutal war, we must remember these facts born out of the hard work of unrelenting independent investigators. We must remember that Russia alone started this war, and its aggression against Ukraine is a blatant violation of the UN Charter 
and of Ukraine's territorial integrity. It is President Putin's single-minded pursuit of the obliteration of the sovereign state of Ukraine and subjugation of its people that is prolonging this war. Even as we sit here, Russia continues to flout international law as it doubles down on its violations of the UN arms embargo on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. To date, Russia has launched DPRK-supplied ballistic missiles against Ukraine on at least nine occasions. Russia and the DPRK must be held accountable for their actions, which undermine long-standing obligations under UN Security Council resolutions. These unlawful arms transfers and potential technology transfers from Russia to the DPRK undermine regional stability and the global nonproliferation regime, as well as the Security Council's credibility. To be clear, Russia is the only aggressor in this war and the only one that could end this war today. But even in the complete absence of any serious demonstration of interest by Putin in a peaceful resolution to the war, Ukraine continues to seek a pathway to a just and lasting peace consistent with principles of the UN Charter. We renew our calls for Russia to immediately withdraw its forces from Ukraine's internationally recognized borders, cease its unlawful procurement of arms and material from the DPRK, and meet its responsibilities as a member of this council. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, we've convened an urgent member meeting of the Security Council in connection with the missile attack carried out by the armed forces of Ukraine on the town of Lysychansk on Saturday, February 3rd. As a result of the attack, the two-story building of a cafe and bakery was almost fully destroyed and the ceilings between the floors collapsed. Approximately 40 people were buried under the rubble. 28 people died, including a pregnant woman and her five-year-old child. Four of the injured are still in very serious condition. We have no doubt that the target and the timing of the attack were not chosen by chance. The city is located close to the line of contact between the two sides and is regularly shelled using a variety of weapons. There are a few recreational facilities there. The neo-Nazis deliberately waited until families were out for a walk on their day off and cynically, cynically attacked what is practically the only place of leisure in Lysychansk. The strike was carried out using high-power explosive, high-precision weapons, presumably HIMARS ML, MLRS rockets were used. The investigative committee of the Russian Federation has already seized fragments of ammunition from the site of the attack and is verifying their provenance. Today, we are certain to hear claims that Russia convenes the Council too often on aspects of the Ukrainian crisis. But it is not us coming up with the reasons for these meetings. It is the Ukrainian militants who have become so savage and brazen that they are committing terrorist acts nearly every week, shelling civilian infrastructure and killing civilians on Russian territory. This is the fourth terrorist attack of this kind in the past month and a half. The actions of the Kiev regime are astonishing in their cruelty and their sophisticated hatred. The shelling in Belgorod, the two strikes on Donetsk, and now the one in the city of Lysychansk took place on weekends and public holidays in areas where civilians congregate in large numbers. And the timing of the strike invariably coincided with peak numbers of visitors at a particular site. In none of the cases was there any military infrastructure nearby. The fact that the junta of Kiev has finally cast off its masks and chosen the path of terrorism is evidenced not only by the frank statements of its ringleaders, but also by the actions that they are taken. Taking, for example, yesterday we learned that Georgian border guards confiscated a batch of explosives disguised as car batteries and intended for terrorist attacks in Voronezh and possibly Polisi. This failed action, which inter alia was aimed at blaming Georgia for everything, is the responsibility of a member of parliament from Zelensky's party. And it is these projects and the style of the most egregious ISIL terrorists that are being funded by Western aid for Ukraine. 
the Ukrainian armed forces undoubtedly have a sense of impunity and all permissiveness. What's more, they are aware of the unconditional support from Washington, London, and Brussels, who do not care about the killing of civilians, the destruction of families and people's lives and futures. In its blind hatred for our country and its desire to somehow weaken Russia, the West is prepared to pay with other people's lives and to renounce universal norms of morality. One hopes that the ordinary citizens of the United States and the European Union who live under brutal censorship and propaganda will hear the whole truth about Kiev's atrocities and the complicity of their own governments in them. They should know that the lethal weapons regularly being sent to Ukraine are used to commit terrorist acts against innocent civilians and civilian infrastructure in violation of international humanitarian law. If someone tries to argue that Western countries have nothing to do with this because it is Kiev that chooses its own targets for its strikes, they should be reminded of the confession made by Mr. Skabitsky, a representative of the main intelligence directorate of Ukraine. In August 2022, he let slip that in order to use HIMARS systems, Kiev needs to agree on the target with Washington ahead of time. So it is thus clear who is an accomplice to the crime committed in Lysychansk. And not just this crime, but dozens, if not hundreds, of others involving Western weapons. Madam President, among such recent heinous crimes of the Banderite junta is the January 24th premeditated attack on the Russian military transport aircraft Il-76 of the Russian Armed Forces, which was carrying 65 Ukrainian prisoners of war for an agreed exchange. As a result of this attack, 74 people were killed, including the Russian crew, military police officers, and all the prisoners of war. I recall that the Kiev regime was perfectly aware of the planned exchange and it was duly informed about the mode of transportation being used and the route by which the prisoners would be transported. Yet almost immediately after the plane crash, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine triumphantly confirmed its involvement, thus de facto recognizing that the aircraft had been shot down by the valiant Ukrainian military on purpose. Yet as soon as the public learned that the plane was transporting captured Ukrainian soldiers to their place of exchange, President Zelensky's office radically changed its talking points and began to cowardly deny any involvement of Ukraine in the disaster. It is telling that President Zelensky initially stated the need for an international investigation into the deaths of those aboard the aircraft. However, as more and more evidence of the Ukrainian Armed Forces involvement emerged, the Kiev regime abandoned this demand as it realized that involving unbiased international experts in the investigation could confirm its guilt and fully destroy Ukraine's already tarnished reputation. Since the meeting we request on, requested on January 25th, the Russian investigation has progressed. We have completed the decoding of the flight data recorder and the voice recorder. We also analyzed washes from fragments of hulls and mechanisms from the crash site and identified traces of hexogen with impurities containing up to 10% of octogenes, which is typical for foreign-made explosives. Today, we possess irrefutable evidence that a Patriot surface-to-air missile was used to carry out the strike, which leaves no doubt that Washington is a direct accomplice in this crime as well. The State Department has not commented on this information in any way. Instead, it has hypocritically suggested that Kiev's representatives do so. More than 670 fragments of victims' bodies, as well as partially preserved personal documents, were found and collected near the crash site. As a result of uh, the genetic tests that were carried out, uh, we can unequivocally confirm the identity of the six crew members, three military police officers, and 65 Ukrainian servicemen who died when the plane crashed. 
the investigation had the genetic data of all the Ukrainian soldiers at its disposal. And we are prepared to share the outcome of our national investigation with any interested international organizations. We have already circulated a letter to this effect to the United Nations. The evidence of the Ukraine Armed Forces' involvement into this terrorist, attacks is, is, uh, terrorist attack on the L-76 is so irrefutable that even the West cannot ignore it. An unnamed French official recently told the Associated Press that the, military, the French military believes that the plane was shot down by a Patriot system from a distance of about 50 kilometers. We once again call on the members of the Security Council and the leadership of the United Nations to decisively condemn the rocket attack on Lysychansk, as well as all other terrorist acts committed by the Kiev regime. The Banderite junta sees your silence as a carte blanche to commit ever more crimes. For our part, we reaffirm that all those involved in these crimes, including their organizers and the executors, will be identified and held accountable. We also reaffirm that all the objectives set for the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, as well as the other goals set for the special military operation, will be achieved, whether by diplomatic or military means. Thank you.